Security Engineering Lecture 5 last segment. Um, this finally brings us to buffer overflows. Uh, we're going to deal with this in great detail in the 1B security course next year, um, but just as a rapid introduction and helicopter tour, malware arrived in the world big time in 1998 when the Morris worm brought down the internet. It spread so quickly between Unix boxes that it flooded the internet of the day with traffic and caused it to wedge. Now, it uh, spread from one machine to another by a number of mechanisms. It had a list of 400-odd passwords that it guessed, and it also used three buffer overflow attacks. And um, these used a, a remote um, command uh, and a long argument that overrang the stack. And so in uh, Berkeley Unix uh, version 3, uh, the finger command um, had the vulnerability that if you gave it too long an input, um, then past a certain point the uh, input would be executed as code. And this was used to spawn a root shell uh, and thus to spread the worm. In the 1B course, you'll see some real examples of this and get an, example to co get an exercise to code up an attack of your own. Another type of code injection that was a real big deal through the 2000s was SQL injection. When people um, rushed to build e-commerce sites uh, uh, without really understanding what could go wrong, and they ended up having um, scripts on their websites which would um, input data and feed these into uh, back-end database systems that ran in SQL, then you could end up getting problems like this. Um, Look at the XKDC cart XKCD cartoon. Hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh dear, did he break something? In a way. Did you really name your son Robert, uh, quote, close bracket, semicolon, drop table student, semicolon? Oh yes, little Bobby tables we call him. Well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. So what's going on here? Well, you can imagine that the school system has got an SQL statement, something like the one you find in the first bullet point, and it inputs a student name. And if that student name um, continues to contain stuff that can be executed as code, then it's executed as code. This is perhaps a, a, a simpler and more easy to visualize example um, of a buffer overflow, although in, in, in this case, the buffer isn't technically overflowed. So here's an exercise for you. How do you go about stopping this? Do you have a policy that you sanitize all inputs or a policy that you don't create SQL statements that include outside data or what? How do you, how do you deal with this? Do you use a different language altogether? Well, to give a, a very brief helicopter tour of the kind of software countermeasures that people use nowadays, and again, this is stuff that will be done in much greater detail in the second and third year, and in, uh, in, indeed in the part three if you go on to do the security research course there. First, modern operating systems have a whole series of defenses against buffer overflows. Just as you provide cars with seat belts, you also um, understand if you're an operating system vendor that people will write dumb code and you do what you can to minimize the uh, consequences of user error, in this case programmer error. You could address space layout randomization um, so that if somehow people manage to get um, uh, data into um, space reserved for code, it's difficult to predict where the code should be and how you can exploit that. Uh, many other systems have got data execution prevention in that um, data are tagged as data and code are tagged as code and you can't execute data as code. Um, there are various ways around this, of course. There are interpreted languages uh, and if you're interested in security, you may have heard of return-oriented programming attacks. Then there's tool choice. If you use strongly typed languages rather than languages like C or C++, um, then uh, many of the um, code injection attacks don't work. Another possibility is defensive programming. If we go back to the early days, to the um, EDSAC, which the um, lab built in 1949, um, this uh, ran on thermionic valves, and it typically broke down once per shift. And so if you wrote software for the EDSAC, you would commonly check the arithmetic. Um, for example, if you masked off three bits, you would then check that the result was less than eight before you used it. And if there was an error, you would throw an exception and get the um, operator to go and check the hardware. 
We do things like that sometimes when we're writing crypto code for smart cards and devices like that because we anticipate that the bad guys might try and fire laser shots at the smart card chips in order to get them to give wrong answers that are exploitable. Um, another way that you can do it with some modern programming languages is by means of assertions. Then, um, in addition to the stuff that you put at the platform level, there are secure coding standards. And um, in the course book, which you will have access to, um, again, when your college libraries are available to you, there's a description of how Microsoft evolved its coding standards for C. And um, if you look at the uh, guest lecture given by Bjarne Straustrup at Churchill College three years ago, which you can get on video, he describes the um, standards and guidelines that he's produced for the C++ language um, in order to make it much more robust. If you've ever interned at a company like Google, um, you'll have experienced that there are set libraries of user-facing code, so you're not allowed to write your own input routines or your own JavaScript for websites. Um, there are specialist teams who do that, and you have to um, use the interfaces they provide. There's much else. Some languages have got contracts, mechanisms whereby uh, different modules in the code agree what sort of uh, data can be passed backwards and forwards. If you don't have constraints, and IFL isn't widely used, there's the more general problem of API analysis. How do you analyze an application programming interface and try and find out whether less trusted code that calls more trusted code, say, in your libraries, could manipulate them? Um, you always have to assume, if you're writing a library, uh, that it may be called by code that's under the control of the enemy. How do you go about dealing with this? Well, that's a subject in itself. Um, and finally, there's a whole series of analysis tools that professional software houses use when doing security testing and safety testing of their code, and which you will definitely come across once you work in professional practice. One approach is fuzzing. You throw large numbers of random inputs at the code and see if you can make something crash. And another is static analysis tools, of which perhaps the best known is Coverity. And um, if Coverity is run over C code that you've written, um, it will pull up lots and lots of ways in which your code deviates from secure coding standards, which you or other people can then look at to see if these lead to an exploit. Now, this is of necessity only a brief helicopter tour, but it should give you some um, idea uh, of the amount of effort that people have to go to to see to it that you don't produce bugs in your code, which leads to um, security failure, which lead to safety hazards, or which lead to um, a, a critical real-time program um, suddenly um, losing synchronization or failing to meet its uh, real-time objectives.